topic on this big platform about the health benefits of the Indian spices and their biopreservation potential. In fact, why we selected this topic for the investigation? As you know that at present, many of the people, they are using the chemicals as the biopreservatives. And these chemicals, needless, needless to say that they are having several health hazards. And the most important point is that most of the food, in most of the food, we are using at present the salt as the biopreservative or sugar as the biopreservative. And both these white compounds, they are injurious to the health. So that's why we thought that when these spices, they are having the antimicrobial properties, then why can't we use these spices as the agents having the biopreservation potential? So that was the purpose of the entire investigation mainly. So the let me come now on the topic that in India, about 83 different types of the spices are cultivated in various parts of the country. And may, mostly the spices, they are the parts of the flowers, barks, leaves, roots, or stems. And they provide the various type of the colors, various types of the aroma, flavor, all these things. And they are in use since time immemorial. If we say, see that in the Rig Veda, Yezur Veda, and in the Vedas, which are 80,000 years old, in these Vedas, there is a mention of these spices. And the spices, they are even today used in the Indian kitchen and the garlic, cinnamon, fenugreek, black pepper, mustard, ginger, coriander, red pepper. And black pepper, clove, cinnamon, these are some of the things which are used everywhere throughout the world. You will find. So I will be taking the only the major spices in this lecture which are having the benefits. The major health benefits of the Indian spices, is it visible? The slide is moving. Yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. It's showing the slide. Yes, yeah, okay. So major health benefits of the Indian spices are that they improve the immune system. They prevent allergies, help fight nasal infections, nausea, throat infections, respiratory infections. They are antioxidants, powerful antioxidants. Anti-diabetics, some of the spices. They improve the memory and the brain functions. They improve the digestion of the system. They are anti-cancerous and they also relieve the pain of the arthritis. They also are having the healing properties and they are having the various other properties. So if we say that most of the spices, but they are what we are using in the Indian kitchen, the most important is the turmeric which is called as the golden spice also. And this is a powerful antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial. It helps in the healing, uh, healing of the property. Mainly what we do, that we can take the turmeric and dissolve it in the oil, and then we can apply it to the wounds. And it is powerful antimicrobial. It is we have seen in our laboratory that such type of the ointment, it is effective even against the staphylococcus. Oh, yes, and it's in the treatment of the arthritis ailments, in it also improve the digestion. And the most of the, in the kitchen, whenever we are using the any of the food material, it is added in the, from, uh, in the food, uh, in the vegetables, and as a, and most of the after adding it into the warm milk in the in the night when they take so this is called this is also uh, used for preparation of the golden milk the black pepper which is called as the black gold also and this black gold it is having the unique flavor unique taste it enhances the absorption of the certain nutrients in the digestive system highly anti-inflammatory protect against cough, cold, and throat infections. Most of the people during that
day and during the winters and the ginger both all these three the black pepper clove and ginger they make the uh, one one black pepper or two black pepper one clove and one very small amount of the ginger they put in the mouth and it gives the flavor it uh, keeps the cough and cold and sneezing away from the infections so this is the throat infection it fight against the throat infection in the winter generally the clove is famous for the aroma unique taste and eugenol is one of the compound which is mainly uh, provide a unique flavor to the uh, food material this potent antimicrobial generally it is used for the toothache and it fight against the oral infections remove removes bad odor from the mouth supports digestion and it is possessing the anti cancerous activity ginger it is generally recommended that 5 to 10 g of the ginger should be used in a day by the adults but the ginger should not be used by the children and the ginger it is having the anti cancerous activity it supports the immune system and it is also very helpful to combat the respiratory infections cold and cough and cumin seeds these are earthy flavor they contain the essential oils antioxidants digestion improve stimulate stimulate and use for the weight management also this is one of the recent uh, particular uh, type of the uh, property of this cumin which is generally uh, by uh, by used by the many of the indian uh, nutrition specialists they recommend fenugreek this is the mouth freshener you will find in any of the hotels in any of the restaurant after taking the meals then they will serve you the uh, as a mouth freshener it is rich in fiber regulate blood sugar level reduce the cholesterol promote milk production in the lactating mothers and it is also used as a supporting digestive system in the children when the children are born then the uh, fenugreek uh, the water of the fenugreek is given to the children so that their digest digestion remain good cinnamon this is one of the most important spice but you will uh, see that when this cinnamon uh, you have to see that it is a hollow pipe like uh, spice and in the hollow pipe like spice, spice the inside material is more important and it also regulates the blood sugar levels reduce in, uh, inflammation cholesterol and it also supports the health so these seven spices are generally used in our host by all indians in the kitchen and if you see their history then in history also you will find that they were the uh, very important spices uh, even in the western countries they were used and in the history you will find that these spices were exported from india to the europe to the arabian countries and they changed and many of the people they tried to develop the links with the uh, with india for the import of these spices they trade in the vedic period you will find that about 30% of the total economy of the world it is being controlled by india alone and the main export material it was the spices this is the one of the very important point which i would like to discuss on this august page for platform that during covid 19 these is spices particularly if we see that black pepper clove ginger these three spices black pepper clove and ginger when we were using these three spices the uh, the decoction of these aqueous aqueous solution of these spices then it was able to control many of the respiratory infections and it also helped in control of the symptoms of the covid-19 there are scientific reports also nowadays that detail reports which say that the spices they are anti inflammatory and they affect against the different cytokines and the inflammatory modulators and the cytokines they are being uh, held uh, attack and thus the health deteriorating due to the covid-19 can be controlled using these spices the spices they attack on these cytokines 
So this is the, these are the, some of the recent information which I wanted to share on this uh, great platform. So I'm coming now on the experiments which have been conducted in uh, Sobharti University and this aqueous extract preparations of the various spices, they can be prepared. The cold infusion we can prepare, uh, decoction can prepare, maceration we can do, or we, even the hot water we can put, and then we can use this decoction as a, as a, uh, in a spice extract, which can be used in various purposes. The percent moisture content, solubility, and the ash content, you will notice that the garlic is possessing the water solubility is 42 percent and the moisture content is uh, 32 percent and these are the these two things they make it very powerful for this particular purpose as the antimicrobial agent also mustard is also one of the uh, spice which is being used uh, for the various purposes now the qualitative phytochemicals what are present in these spices, it has been seen that the alkaloids, flavonoids, tannins, terpenoids, carbohydrates, and proteins, these are present in various spices, in the various amounts. You know, this is one of the important uh, slides where I would like to invite the attention of the uh, young people and, uh, uh, and those who are interested in the uh, spices. You will notice that the Bacillus subtilis, Salmonella, Enterica, these are the food pathogens which generally uh, cause the various ailments. Staphylococcus aureus, Escherichia coli, Chronobacter, Sakajaki, Shigella, Pseudomonas, and Webrivoli. Against these pathogens, we try to see the effect of this aqueous extract of these spices turmeric, black pepper, fenugreek, garlic mustard, clove, cumin, and cinnamon. You will notice that black pepper is one of the wonderful uh, spice which were active, which was active against many of these food pathogens. Again, you will find that cumin which was also active. Clove was also active. And this cinnamon was also highly active. And if you compare the entire table, then you will find that the one or the other spice is active against one or the other bacteria. And in Indian kitchen, all these spices, they are used, used as a regular spice in the preparation of the various food materials, in the various, uh, very, various things. That is why it is estimated that the Indians, they are having less food, food poisons generally in comparison to the western countries there are the some reports so we can say or we can correlate this that the less percentage of the food poisonous food for food poisoning in india may be because of the wide use of these spices in their food with the antimicrobial activity using the agar diffusion assay we have seen that the cumin ginger and all these spices, they are having the antibacterial activities again, Bacillus subtilis, Staphylococcus aureus, Escherichia coli, Chronobacter sacajaki, Vibrio cholerae, Shigella flexneri, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Salmonella enteric. Now, what happens that what we can do it? What is that, uh, that, how we can, we try to do the one of the experiment that when we added this aqueous extract of the, the spices in the vegetables, common vegetables, then we noticed that the pH, when this pH was acidic, then this pH, it turned towards the, towards the uh, alkaline nature. For example, in tomato, when these spices were added, that turmeric when added, then from the acidity it turns towards the from highly acidity it is turned towards the alkaline. And with the cinnamon, with the cumin, 7.6 pH. That is when we add this aqueous extract in these vegetables, then the pH of the vegetables it tend to go towards the alkaline nature and the alkaline nature of the vegetables is helpful in the digestion.
Now, what we try to do that how these spices can be used as a biopreservative. And when we try to see that potato, when we uh, treated this potato and we uh, wrap this potato in the uh, powder, for a turmeric powder, turmeric powder we wrapped uh, or just uh, turmeric powder was sprinkled over the potato, uh, for potato which was boiled. Now, after treatment, you see that the bacterial infections or the bacterial contamination, it was reduced 50%, more than 50%. On day two, the more than 30, more than 60, 70%. On day three, it was also the 75% bacterial contamination was reduced. That is, not only that they are active when we are adding the, adding the aqueous extract, but if we wrap this, so if we are keeping this potato or the vegetables in the refrigerator, then we can treat or we can give the uh, powder form of the Indian spices and this powder form of the Indian spices will keep the, uh, keep the vegetables, uh, will increase the refrigeration shelf life of the vegetables, you can say it. And you know that the spices, they are not having any side effects. And in Indian kitchen, they are being used. So they are having the advantage that they can be used as a biopreservatives. Similarly, when we use the terror roots, in terror roots also we notice the same amount of the uh, decrease in the uh, uh, number of bacterial counts uh, on, from day one to day three. And also, you, you can see in the treatment, there's a number of the colonies here. In tomato also, it was reduced. So the, in vegetables, because normally we are using them. So if we add, if we want to increase the shelf life of the vegetables, refrigerate the shelf life, then we can add the spices in the powder form and then it will protect them. So this is the another experiment what we did. Turmeric, black pepper, ginger, cumin, the separately. But when the turmeric and black pepper both were mixed, then it was a drastic effect. The number of the colonies of the bacterial colony it reduced dramatically. Turmeric and ginger when it was used again, and when turmeric, black pepper, ginger and cumin, all these four spices were were given. To the potatoes, then we found that the number of the bacterial colonies get reduced on drastically, drastically. That is the mixture of these uh, spices. It can be used for as a biopreservative agents. Similarly, on the terror roots, we found the same type of the uh, results. Even in the bottle guards, we found the same results. Even in the tomato, we found the same results, and now, this uh, bacterial colony forming units and the spice treated and untreated foods is stored in the refrigerator. In from the refrigerator, when we uh, do, then we also try to isolate these bacterial populations, and we found that, that on the Dead Sea, the bacterial populations were quite low. The, the takeaway of the today's lecture is that the Indian spices used as the food additives provide different flavors, colors, they enhance taste. They contain phenolics, tannins, flavonoids, alkaloids, and possess antioxidant properties. They are having the antimicrobial properties active against foodborne pathogens and may be used as the food preservatives. This is the one of the concept what we have given that if they are used as a food preservatives, biopreservatives, you can say it, then we will be able to treat with the many of the side effects of these chemical preservatives which are being used at present for the preservation of the food. Uh, some more uh, results experiments they are required and I request the August body or the scientific body which are who are uh, uh, listening and hearing my lecture they should also start using uh, doing some experiments on this activity that how these Indian spices can be used as a food preservatives. They protect the spleen, pancreas, effective against cough, sneezing, sore throat, improve digestion, 
turmeric golden spice generally called as powerful antioxidant anti inflammatory antimicrobial healing properties used in treatment of the arthritis here uh, here ailments are also reduced and the certain cancers it is also neuroprotective and help in digestion black pepper it is unique flavor taste and black pepper you know that the entire europe in entire europe or entire western countries or almost every country throughout the world they are using this black pepper as a unique flavor and as a for the taste and for something so enhance the absorption of the certain nutrients highly inflammatory protect against cough cold and throat infections cloves famous for aroma unique taste potent antimicrobial anti inflammatory and it the it, it fight against the oral infections removes bad odor from the mouth support digestion and it anti cancers ginger ginger i would like to say that more than 10 gram of the ginger when we try to use then we found that it is having some adverse effect on the gut microbiota that paper we are going to publish very shortly so i would like to recommend that the ginger only in a small amounts only up to the 5 to 10 gram maximum 10 gram should be given to the adults and to the children it should not be given the ginger leaves nausea cough cold and throat infections and it combat the respiratory infections and the support the immune system thank you very much if there are any questions or uh, i will be Auto laryngeal conference. Today, I'm going to present my topic on DNA mutilation, a telltale sign for cancer inception. In this, before going to the uh, proper topic, just I'm going to refresh the knowledge about the cell contents and the DNA. Uh, the human cell or eukaryotic, any eukaryotic cell contains an outer envelope of the cell, which envelops or encloses the cytoplasm. which contains suspended cell organelles in the center of the cytoplasm there will be nucleus and in the nucleus the genetic material will be packed in the form of chromatin and this chromatin is very much important for the transmission of the genetic material from individuals to their offspring coming to basic definitions that is chromosome chromosomes are long thread like structures located in the nucleus of eukaryotic cells gene it is a locus or a region on dna that encodes a functional rna or protein a mutation is a sudden inheritable change in the genetic makeup of an individual nucleic acids are the principal informational molecules of the cells there are two types of nucleic acids in cells namely deoxyribonucleic acids and ribonucleic acid primarily nucleic acids serve as repositories and transmitters of genetic information and this is the structure that is the double helical structure which was given by batson and crick we all know about this and uh, the dna contains a double helical twisted double helical structure in which two complementary strands are present and each strand contains a backbone of alternating base pair and a sugar alternating phosphate and sugar molecule uh, the sugar is deoxyribose sugar that is a pentose sugar and to this sugar the base pairs like purines and pyrimidines like thymine guanine adenosine adenine and cytosine these are attached to this sugar molecules and the sugar molecules are divided into purines and pyrimidines the purines are adenine and guanine pyrimidines are thymine and cytosine adenine is coupled or linked with the thymine with the help of a double bond whereas cytosine is coupled with a guanine with the help of a triple bond and the dna contains major groups and minor groups the distance between the major groups is two major groups two adjacent major groups is 3.5 nanometers whereas the distance between two adjacent cross linkages are the two adjacent nitrogen bases or the nucleotides is 0.34 nanometers dna contains very stable and in, uh, genetic information in a very stable and integrated manner maintained by the presence of highly sophisticated techniques but the dna sequence or the structure is disrupted as a usual day to day event and, and is reverted by various repair mechanisms 
failure of these repair contrivances turns out to be the primary causal factor for cancer and much other inherited acquired pathologies. In this presentation, I am going to highlight uh, various types of DNA damages, enumerate their causative factors with a short discussion on recent modalities of DNA damage detection. Coming to DNA mutilation, it is uh, defined as uh, alteration in genomic integrity due to severances compelled by various exogenous and endogenous factors. The endogenous factors in DNA damage are oxidative damage to the bases, that is nitrogen bases, alkylation of the bases, most commonly methylation, hydrolysis of bases, erroneous replication. All these are the endogenous factors in DNA damage. The exogenous factors being damage caused by physical agents and damage caused by environmental chemical agents. Under physical agents, the factors are UV light and ionizing radiation. The types of DNA damage can be as follows. It can be rupture of the strand or abasic sites, alteration of bases, destruction of sugars, that is deoxyribose sugar, cross links and formation of dimers, and bulky DNA attacks. And each one I'm going to discuss in detail. The first one is types uh, rupture of the strand. The rupture can be single strand or double strand breaks. DNA, as we know, DNA contains two strands. One is, uh, uh, one strand is complementary to the other strand. If the break occurs in single strand, that is called as single strand break. If the break occurs in both the strands, it is called as double strand breaks. The single strand breaks can be due to the following reasons. Our etiological factors for the single strand breaks are oxidation of bases, or sugars by endogenous reactive oxygen species, that is, reactive oxygen species are hydroxyl ions, peroxide ions, etc. They can be due to precisely via disintegration of the oxidized sugar or patch up or discursively during the patch up of oxidized bases, a basic sites or altered bases by base excision repair mechanisms. The other cause is erroneous or abortive activity of cellular enzymes such as DNA tocomerase 1, an unacceptable incorporation of ribonucleotides into DNA. The double strand breaks can be due to replication across a nick, giving rise to, suppose if there is a nick in the single strand, when it is attempting to replicate, then it will become a double strand break. Then the second most, cause is, most common cause is reactive oxygen species. Then the next cause is natural ionizing radiation of the environment under. The damage is directly proportion, proportional to the radiation dosage. The next cause is inadvertent action of nuclear enzymes on DNA and corporeal stress on the DNA duplex. And the next reason is enzymatic action of SPO1. It is a topomerase 2 like enzyme in meiotic cells. All these reasons will together cause strand breaks, either single strand breaks or double strand breaks. The next type of damage is, uh, that is about the strand breaks. The next is uh, abasic sites. Abasic sites means absence of bases. The bases can be purines or pyrimidines. If the purines are absent, then it is called a purinic. If the pyrimidines are absent, then it is called a pyrimidinic. These sites are most probable abasic lesions in DNA that are formed by spontaneous hydrolysis of the N-glycosylic bond or as an outcome of elimination of impaired or inapt bases by DNA glycosylases. These DNA glycosylases are enzymes that will attempt to repair the DNA or participate in the repair of the DNA damages. Methylation, oxidation, and deamination of purines or pyrimidines bring in diverse lesions such as N7 methylguanine, etc. Confederacy in inapt of inapt bases such as uracil during replication and repair of forementioned DNA damages are removed by specific DNA glycosylases yielding epurinic or epirimidinic sites. These AP sites that are profusely formed impede the DNA replication and the transcription and reroute apoptosis or DNA repair. Furthermore, they are also mutagenic. They are also mutagenic, moving to single base pair substitution or split at the AP sites by AP endonuclease, endonucleases, DNA N glycosylases or AP lyases, or these are the enzymes bringing about single strand formation. 
the next type of damage so far we have seen about rupture of the strand and a basic sites the next type of damage is alteration of the bases the basic the base the structure of the nitrogen base is altered in this type of damage here the bases can be damaged or destroyed by radiation pyrimidines are more open to radiation attack than purines because the purines are more stable to the radiation the damage to the or alteration of the bases can be mismatches deletions or insertions loss of one or more base pairs from the dna is called as deletion deletion of one or more one or two bases alters the genetic frame resulting in a distorted non protective message deletions of three or more bases leave the reading frame intact if the bases are deleted that that leaves the reading frame intact but if the codons are two or more one or more codons are deleted then it will become a problem deleterious problem because uh, each codon it codes for an amino acid of the protein and each codon is made up of three nitrogen bases if one or two bases is missing that will uh, leave the open reading frame open uh, intact but if the more codons are deleted then it will result in a uh, mistaken protein insertion is the addition of one or more nucleotide base pairs into dna sequence most often due to dna polymerase slippage they can range from single base pair insertion incorrectly into a dna sequence or at times a segment of one chromosome is erroneously inserted into another the next type of damage is destruction of sugars the main sugar that is present in dna is deoxyribose sugar which is a pentose sugar that contains five carbon atoms it is particularly susceptible to hydroxyl radical damage particularly when these are generated close contiguity Yes. Site specific damage by these free radicals leads to oxidation of the deoxyribose moiety tracked by the release of pyrimidines or strand scissions. So strand scission means it is the cutting of the stranded specific sites. Different product spectra are formed by oxidation of this two deoxyribose sugar under aerobic and anaerobic conditions. When traces of transition metal like iron, sometimes uh, this metal metal is also um, causes damage to the structure of the dna and sometimes uh, these metal ions like iron are present in are present uh, then deoxyribose is cleaved to liberate malon dialyhyde this malon dialyhyde uh, will result in the uh, production of adducts dna adducts the major adduct to dna uh, to dna is pyrimidopurinone called m1g which gives rise to secondary damaging cellular events the next type of damage is cross links and formation of dimers unsolicited links in dna can occur in the same strand that is this cross links in the within the strand are called as intra strand whereas cross links in between two complementary strands are called as inter strand and these cross links can be formed within the strand same strand or emit of emit two, two complementary strands or between a base on dna and a reactive group on a protein Interstrand cross links prevent DNA strand from queuing apart, thus creating an outright impediment to DNA replication and or transcription, summing up to cell death. The contraction of cytotoxic effect is intellectually used currently in anti-cancer therapy. And these actually, whenever the cross links or the dimer are formed in the normal healthy cell, then it leads to mutation and results in mismatched proteins and all, and that results in cancer or neoplasm. If the same crosslinks happen in the mutated cells, then there will be death of the mutated cells, and that can be used in chemotherapy. And this is being used. This is a principle behind the usage usage of the alkylating agents as anti-cancer drugs. The most common alkylating agents are mitomycin B and nitrogen mustards, etc. Et crosslinking agents typically damage the chromosomes in the manner of gain, loss, rearrangements of chromosome segments. or sister chromatid exchanges rather than altering the dna sequence that is they are clastogenic but not mutagenic the next 
type of damage to the DNA is, is bulky DNA adducts. DNA adduct is a portion of DNA that is covalently bound to chemical moiety resulting in abnormal replication that is the degree of chemical carcinogenesis. The DNA adducts may be due to the chemical substances like N-nitrosamines which are most commonly found in tobacco, aflatoxins, aromatic amines and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These are the few classes of carcinogens which form DNA adducts. And these are the main reasons for behind the chemical carcinogenesis. The first one is N-nitrosamines. N-nitrosamine DNA adducts results from either methylation or A2 and AFG1 and AFG2 are the most four major naturally occurring aflatoxins of which AFB1 is the most abundant as well as the most carcinogenic. The metabolic activation of AFB1 are base catalyzed opening of the imidazole ring to yield pyrimidine adducts. The next class of chemicals are aromatic amines. The stimulation of this nitro polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons is by nitro reduction and is by nitro reduction to n hydroxyrylamine and cause direct damage to DNA. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, DNA adduct formation of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons normally involves cis or trans opening of the epoxide ring with covalent covalent attachment at the benzylic carbon of the dihydrodiol epoxide. Generally, guanine is the guanine is one of the bases. Guanine is the choice for such reactions. However, depending upon the PAH, that is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, considerable binding can also occur with adenine and cytosine. And this is a, just a, a repetition of whatever I have told so far. Here, we can see the single strand breaks, that is strand in the that is a break in the single strand, first one strand. Here, if you observe, there are double strand breaks. These two strands are complementary to each other and the, there is a break in both the strands. These are called as double strand breaks and mismatch of the nitrogen bases. Here, the bases which are supposed to be complementary to each other will be changed. That is called as mismatch of the complementary bases. Then interstrand and intrastrand cross-linking agents. If the cross-linking agents are formed within the strand, then it is called as intra-strand cross-links. If the cross-linking agents are formed in between the two complementary strands, then it is called as inter-strand cross-links. Then dimers. Most commonly, dimers are formed in the pyrimidines like uh, TT dimer and uh, CC dimer, etc. And uh, the next damage is, the type of damage is DNA adducts. DNA adducts is the uh, attachment of the metal to uh, uh, nitrogen base that is called as DNA adduct. That is about the uh, types of damage to the DNA. And the next is uh, factors causing DNA damage. The factors of the DNA dam causing DNA damage can be categorized into endogenous factors in DNA damage and exogenous factors. The endogenous factors being oxidative damage by ROS, alkylation of the bases, hydrolysis of bases, and erroneous replication. The first one is oxidative damage. This occurs by the ROS, that is reactive oxygen species. The reactive oxygen species uh, uh, can liberate from various exogenous and endogenous sources like mitochondrial stress, lipooxygenase pathways, inflammatory cytokines, etc. And these reactive oxygen species cause damage to DNA, proteins, and lipids. When they act on DNA, they cause the deoxyribose oxidation, strand breakage, and cross links. When they act on proteins, they cause protein oxidation. And when they act on lipids, they cause lipid oxidation, peroxidation. And whatever the substrate that is being acted upon by the ROS, finally, that will cause carcinogenesis through uh, the, the given pathways. That is, when DNA is act, uh, acted upon, it leads to oncosine activation and tumor suppressor gene inactivation. If it is acted upon uh, proteins, then it is called uh, causes enzyme activation or inactivation. If it acts upon lipids, then it causes uh, synthesis of malone dialhyde leading to DNA adduct formation, all together leading to carcinogenesis. 
in order to limit the mutagenesis, uh, there are some specialized mechanisms or inbuilt mechanisms in the body that is base excision repair, essentially removes single oxidized base or nucleotide excision repair. It is a process more complex lesions containing oligonucleotides. Suppose a nucleotide or some part, uh, two or three nucleotides are removed, then it is called as nucleotide excision repair. If a single base is, uh, has to be repaired, then it is done by base excision repair. The next type of uh, factor is alkylation of bases. Most common alkylation is uh, methylation. Methylation is specifically transfer of single carbon group, whereas alkylation refers to transfer of long chain carbon groups. Uh, in the alkylating agents also, there are hard alkylating agents uh, which, cause, uh, which cause the production of uh, oxygen nucleophiles, whereas uh, depending on the size, small size, positive charge, low polarizability, which define hard alkylating agents like diazonium ions are highly reactive with oxygen nucleophiles. The other type of alkylating agents are large uncharged polarizable alkylating agents like dialkylene sulfates. They favor the reaction with the nitrogen centers in the DNA. The guanine is most susceptible to this alkylating agent. Uh, and guanine residues at N7 position is chiefly nucleophilic and they, product, they cause the production of electrophiles and these electrophiles cause the uh, damage to DNA. The next is hydrolysis of bases. Hydrolytic damage, which is the modest form of endogenous DNA damage, causes deep urination, deep permeation with consequential abasic sites. Whenever the bases are damaged by hydrolysis, there will be loss of the base at the site. This leads to abasic site, which is a type of DNA damage. When compared to pyrimidine bases, the hydrolytic damage is much faster at the purine bases. The abasic sites does generate single strand breaks on. When the single strand breaks are replicated, then it leads to formation of double strand breaks. And uh, these hydrolysis is occurring day to day, day to day phenomenon only. But if any um, problem occurs in the replication or repair mechanisms, then uh, the mutations will occur. Otherwise, whatever the hydrolysis that is being happened in, day, in a day to day activity, that will be repaired. Then the next factor is erroneous replication. DNA replication is a fundamental and sternly regulated cellular process that assures the precise duplication of cells' genetic material, but mistakes in DNA replication do occur due to insertion of incompetent nucleotide, augmented or paucity of nucleotides in a sequence, or looping or jumping of DNA polymerases. If such deletions include the regions containing tumor suppressor genes, that is, tumor suppressor genes are the genes that will suppress the unwanted replication, replication or proliferation. If any deletion of tumor suppressor gene occurs, then it leads to malignancy. Upon entry into cell, uh, cell into S phase, wide range of contrivances ensures that the instigation of replication machinery is visible to avoid re-replication and warrant genome stability. To optimize the likelihood of such errors, a proofreading machinery comes into play during which the DNA polymerase makes out these errors and replaces them correctly. Corrections are done by mismatch repair process, further reducing final error rate. The exogenous factors uh, that causes DNA damages are, it can be physical agents or can be environmental chemical agents. The physical agents, among the physical agents, UV light is the most common physical agent, ionic radiation. Uh, among the UV lights, there are three types of UV lights, UVA, UVB, and UVC. And uh, UVB is most detrimental to DNA structure. UVB has a shorter wavelength and a more forthright effect on DNA, but providentially, UVB radiation occupies a very trivial part of the total solar energy. It modifies the chemical composition of DNA by forming dimers, that is, pyrimidine dimers like TT dimers, CC dimers, cytosine cytosine dimers, which disrupt the molecular composition. The thymidine dimers and this TT dimerization leads to DNA damage. UVC, owing to its high absorption atmosphere, UVC is not so substantial menace to the cells. The next is ionizing radiation. This ionizing radiation can be of two types, electromagnetic radiation, which, be, which can be a in the form of photons, or particulate radiation in the form of in, or hadrons. Electromagnetic radiation, it can be X-rays or gamma rays, whereas particulate radiation can be in the form of beta particles, alpha particles, electrons and protons, neutrons, etc. 
the heavily charged ions such as the nuclei of argon nitrogen carbon like uh, 12 12c and other elements which interact with the nucleus of the atoms and uh, they cause adduct formation and finally leading to damage to dna and mutations moreover the dna damage is caused by high linear energy transfer radiations and localized and more challenging to repair than the disseminated damage caused by low linear energy transfer radiations there are two types in the energy levels one is high linear energy transfer radiations another one is low linear energy transfer radiations the damage is caused by high linear energy trans uh, transmission radiations are localized and they are more challenging to the repair whereas uh, low linear energy transfer radiations are disseminated and they can be they are lesser damaging the radiation damage genome integrity producing a wide range of dna lesions that is damage to nucleotide bases single strand breaks and double strand breaks dna strand breakage which is customarily measured is customarily measured by the indicator of the radiation damage the radiation damage in a cell or uh, tissue can be uh, measured by dna strand breakages that is single strand breakage or double strand breakage then damage is caused by the chemical agents there are various chemical agents the first one is alkylating agents these alkylating agents are capable of transferring one or two alkyl groups to the nucleophilic position of the dna bases resulting in the formation of uh, reactive electrophiles and these reactive electrophiles react with the two nucleophilic sites of dna it results in cross linking within the dna strand or with the another strand or with exogenous or endogenous protein compounds and finally leading to adduct formation dna adducts leads to that is a type of damaged dna and these adducts if replicated this leads to tumorigenesis or carcinogenesis the next type of uh, uh, chemicals are aflatoxins in the day to day activity uh, the aspergillus flavus and aspergillus uh, parasiticus they contaminate the various food resources such as rice wheat maize corn peanuts etc in stored in warm and humid places and uh, these fungi they produce aflatoxin b1 this aflatoxin b1 forms dna and rna protein adducts because the aflatoxin combines with the dna nitrogen bases and pro produces the dna adducts and uh, these adducts will cause mutations in uh, most commonly in hepatocytes leading to hepatocellular carcinoma then coming to these are the sources or factors that cause the dna damage and uh, how to detect these dna damages delineating the dna damage site of the dna can be done using any of the molecular structure study methods promptness good reproducibility economical formidable competency and finally no isotopic pollution are the factors that could be contemplated while making a choice of the method there are various there are the following uh, techniques or molecular techniques which can be used for detecting this dna damage they are being comet assay or single cell electrophoresis pulsed field gel electrophoresis fluorescence spectrophotometry and competitive immunoassay cleaving enzyme fragment length polymorphism analysis ll specific amplification method these are the methods of detecting the dna damage and these are being used nowadays to detect the dna damage these are my references and with this i am concluding my presentation on dna damages and the factors causing dna damage thank you that they have a different clinical behavior from uh, osteosarcoma on the extremity. I find it that it's important that we specifically talk about them uh, regards uh, their, their approach and treatment and different prognosis. So this is a brief uh, table of contents I'd like to address, um, sharing a bit about our longer experience at the end. Um, very briefly, sarcomas are formed by neoplastic cells that synthesize and secrete organic components of the bone matrix, and they are the uh, most frequent primary malignant tumor arising in the bone. They usually affect lung bones. Uh, however, they can present in the craniofacial bones up to 6%. 
And um, as I said, they are pretty infrequent. They account for less than 1% of head and neck cancers. So when we, went to, when we talk about their epidemiology, they start showing some differences from the osseous sarcomas of the lung bones. Um, these specific demographic characteristics are appear, for instance, at the peak of age, um, while peak incidence for extremities of osseous sarcomas are during the adolescence. Uh, head and neck osseous sarcomas generally present at a later age, uh, between the third and the fourth decade of life, with a wide range. There's a study by Cassier et al. at a uh, meta-analysis with 173 patients that reports a median age of 36 years. Um, Oh, sorry, I'm getting a, 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 a notice in the screen. Do you see that? Hello? No, we couldn't. Hello? No, Dr. Rendren, we couldn't see you. Oh, okay, okay. Um, let me um, see how can, I can... Uh, I can... It's, it's okay, doctor. You shall continue. I, I don't know if I can. Uh, okay. I need to stop sharing to open my video. Okay. Sorry. There I go. And uh, I'll share my screen again. Okay. So, um, as I was uh, saying, um, Um, there's also a, a, a study by uh, Smith um, in a review of the National Cancer Database from um, the United States with 196 patients, where they also show a similar uh, medium age. And uh, northworthy of this, of this study, um, the age of presentation uh, of men was strikingly lower than the age of presentation in women. Um, almost 10 years, uh, statistically significant. And um, as I told you before, they uh, present of, uh, in patients older than the uh, extremities of sarcomas. Um, the gender um, distribution is, uh, is equal, is one, in a ratio one to one. And uh, when we see the subsites they, they present, uh, head and neck osteosarcomas affects mostly the jaws uh, in more than 80% of the cases, Mon uh, mostly the mandible, uh, usually being the most common site, and followed by the maxilla. In the mandible, we normally see these tumors in the body on the ramos, and in the maxilla, normally in the alveolar ridge, the premaxilla, it can also affect other places like the heart palate, uh, paranasal sinuses, etc. The, the percentages shown here are from the study from Guadagnolo from MD Anderson a while ago, but they uh, maintain uh, till nowadays. Um, from the risk factors, um, there are some uh, very well described. There are some genetic predispositions from for young patients that they are associated with some specific syndromes. There are some germline mutation uh, syndromes associated to, to tumor suppressor genes like Lifraumeni syndrome or retinoblastoma syndrome. And there are also some germ mutations associated with DNA helicus. Um, it's also described that it's associated with uh, bone dysplasias and history of trauma, bone infarcts, chronic osteomyelitis, or metallic implants. Uh, however, the most strongly associated um, factor is the history of previous uh, radiotherapy to the head and neck. As in fact, um, a study by Patel reported on 44 patients treated at uh, Memorial Slow Caring Center um, in New York, and they showed that almost 15% of the patients had the history of previous radiotherapy. Normally, different theories show that this history is uh, probably radiotherapy to, uh, due to leukemia or lymphoma. And um, it's also important parallelly to know um, where the where the uh, patient it's it's coming from. For instance, there's a this is a series from Luo et al. It's from China. Uh, so he has almost forty three percent of the patients associated with previous radiotherapy due to nasopharyngeal cancer, as this is an endemic um, disease at at the country, right? Um, this is a cohort from Massachusetts General Hospital with 47 patients. They here showed um, that prior radiation uh, to the head and neck was documented in 10, which is 27% of the patients, and that was statistically associated uh, in this univariate analysis with a, a poor survival. So when we come to clinical presentation, um, 
it's gonna vary depending on two more uh, um, location and its size probably, uh, but the most uh, frequent um, um, symptoms that we see is local swelling and pain in more than 70% of the patients. It can also be associated with facial dysesthesia and loosening of the teeth. Um, uh, and they, these are normally uh, very rapid growing tumors. So the average of time uh, presentation at the consult is two to four months. Um, on physical examination, we normally see a non-painful mass uh, fixed to the underlying bone. Um, this photo that you're seeing is one of the patients at our institution. You can see it's a very early tumor. Uh, it's not big in size. Um, it has a small swelling in the right maxillary heart um, and bony consistency. And you can see it only has a slice, slight irritation of the mucosa. Um, very different for other, other patients also presenting in our institution, which are uh, these two, where you can see obvious and, and very big tumors. Um, the tumor size uh, uh, in average is around five centimeters. We have also uh, to uh, always remember that these tumors may have a really uh, fast growing uh, onset. So this is another patient from our institution. When you can see in the right, the, the tumor on the inferior alveolar ridge, uh, which, uh, uh, of which he presented, and then the tumor growing only three weeks later. So when we do the diagnosis, it's only based, uh, it's mainly based in radiological and pathological findings. Um, the imaging um, can be uh, used uh, with X-rays, uh, CTs, or MRIs, and it is important that these uh, imaging tests are searching uh, and assessing for the bone in involvement and the bone destruction. They are also assessing the involvement of the soft tissues around in the tumor, and of course the resecability of the tumor. And of course, uh, as staging says there in the last um, the word. Uh, it's has, they have to look for distant uh, diseases, especially for pulmonary metastasis. So we can start with x-rays. This is the same patient, the one I showed you uh, initially with an early tumor from our institution. And you can mainly see here, there's a widening on the periodontal membrane space. Um, However, there are other signs as this, as this one showed in the photo there, that it's a sunburst um, periostal reaction. CT is um, very useful for these tumors. We can assess the extent of the, the bone involvement and the pattern, which is um, a, it distracted. Uh, we can assess the cortical um, and periosteal reactions. We can see there's a presence of, of matrix mineralization. We can assess the tumor size and tumor margins, and possible the presence of prior uh, bone disease, as I stated, that the, it, it could be frequently seen, and the evaluation of possible on distant metastasis, obviously mainly to the lung. Um, whoops, sorry, there were videos. I don't know if they're running correctly. These are all patients of our institution. You can assess the bone destruction seen in the different imaging. Um, for magnetic uh, resonance, uh, we normally ask um, them when we need uh, to further assess the um, soft tissue involvement, the size of the mass, and um, MRIs are, are um, uh, specifically uh, uh, depict uh, on showing the bone marrow infiltration, uh, which is for that it's better than the CT and it can show the cortical destruction and um, expansive masses. It's very sensitive uh, when we need to dramatically assess the soft tissue surrounding the tumor as it can happen in tumors involving the school base um, for which it's crucial to define the tumor resecability. And um, also imaging has to cover the, the distant metastasis. So for this, the best imaging is the PET CT. Um, assessing for the uh, uh, tumors in maybe uh, the metastasizing to the lung or elsewhere. elsewhere. Uh, when it comes to histology, this is the same patient I showed you earlier. Um, is, this is a gold standard for the diagnosis. Um, it can be an incisional or an open biopsy. The important thing is that we um, recognize the osteoid production by the tumor cells so we can make the diagnosis. There are several types of um, 
um, histological classification. The only thing uh, we need to remember is that they can be central or, or in the or peripheral. And the most um, frequent ones under are the conventional osteosarcomas, which are controplastic, fibroblastic, and osteoblastic, that account for more than 80%. Uh, from this, more than 50% is represented by controplastic and osteoblastic sarcomas. And this has to be, uh, this is linked some, uh, somehow to the survival. So here you can see that, for instance, a periosteal, which is a, is a superficial sarcoma, uh, has a better survival. Also, the controplastic sarcoma has a little better survival than the osteosarcoma, not otherwise specified. Histological grading is um, is a key part of the microscopic description we have uh, to ask our uh, uh, pathologists, um, in, and because it has shown to be an important prognostic factor, and it's also used nowadays for the stage. So when it comes to treatment, uh, we need to remember that the most of the work done in a sarcoma comes with pro, uh, um, from small series and mainly retrospective series. Uh, most of the knowledge we are using for these patients, uh, it's coming from studies made on long bones or, or extremities of sarcoma, which are not exactly the same. Uh, we have key differences. So uh, when it comes to age, we already saw this, this present at a different age. Um, they have a slower, uh, or lower metastatic potential to the lung than the uh, long bone of sarcoma, but they have a, a um, dramatically higher local recurrence. Uh, this could be explained maybe because it's difficult to assess to achieve wide margins in the head and neck, but um, all of these features confer the head and neck osteosarcomas a different prognosis. So they need to be assessed in a different way. Um, Surgery uh, still remains the cornerstone of the treatment and negative margins will be the main prognostic factor we need to um, address and achieve. Uh, so, local, so we can achieve local, local regional control. They are hard to achieve in the head and neck because of the, all the sensitive structures that may be surrounding the tumor. Maybe they can be easier to achieve in the mandibular tumors, uh, but there's also non-consensus whether what uh, what's the definition for an adequate margin? Are we going to ask one centimeter as we ask for the squamous carcinomas, for instance, of the mandible? Or what exactly means an insufficient or a closed margin or even a positive margin? Uh, on top of that, when we are operating these tumors, we don't have the, the um, a tool of the frozen section because it's not available for bone. So, uh, negative margins, though, have uh, shown that they... Um, they have a dramatic impact in survival. So this is a study made by Ha when uh, that showed that a drop that there's a drop on overall survival from seventy five percent to thirty five percent when there's positive margin. So that's uh, something that we really struggle to to work uh, to achieve. This is a uh, um, meta analysis by Smiley on nineteen eighty eight, and it it it. Uh, clearly states that patients uh, benefit from overall and disease-free survival a point of view when complete resection was achieved versus incomplete resections. So how do we treat the neck? When we discuss about the neck, it's widely agreed that prophylactic dissection in n serious neck is not indicated, independent of the tumor size, or even if it's a high histological grade. However, selective neck dissections may be offered only in patients with a positive lymph nodes of the cervical um, region. Um, however, maybe this could be further assessed as the evidence we are basing uh, these decisions are fairly old nowadays. When it comes to chemotherapy, there are many trials that indicate the benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy in improving survival for the patients with poor osteosarcomity, uh, extremity osteosarcomas, as this one um, by Link, which made a dramatically improve in the two year disease survival from 17 to 16. 66% when adding the chemotherapy to the to surgery. And after that, a lot of uh, standardized uh, treatment protocols start involving, of course, the chemotherapy to these patients, uh, showing significant improvements to the overall survival, up to 60 to 80% uh, for extremity sarcomas, compared to 10 to 20% for surgery alone. 
So uh, a lot of agents has been studied and validated. Um, and multimodal treatment has also shown to improve the disease survival. And, the, and some trials include even the role of new adjuvant chemotherapy uh, with a good success in, in limb preservation for uh, long bone osteosarcomas. However, there are um, few meta-analyses that involve uh, head and neck cases. Patients with head and neck are normally left outside these big studies. Uh, and we need to remember as well that um, the chemotherapy is addressing the lung micrometastasis and head and neck osteosarcomas have um, a fair uh, lower percentage of uh, distant metastasis risk than extremities of the sarcoma. Um, this is the study by Smiley with 200 patients with head and neck osteosarcoma, and they did found a statistically significant survival benefit in patients who underwent chemotherapy and surgery versus surgery alone, and on overall survival and on disease-free survival. Um, moreover, chemotherapy have found to increase survival even in the cases with uh, incomplete resection. Uh, sorry, this on a more uh, recent study on 2017 by Boone is a retrospective study, including 77 patients with hair and neck sarcomas. And um, they also reported an improved disease uh, on pre survival from 33% to 67% in the addition of new adjuvant or adjuvant um, chemotherapy demonstrated a, in patients that had intermediate or high-grade tumors that were younger than 75 pip, uh, years and who received chemotherapy in both in univariate and in multivariate analysis. So um, we are also addressing the, the topic of uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy now for head and neck sarcomas. They may allow assessment on the response of chemotherapy and they be, it, this may be useful as a prognostic factor to define the adjuvant treatment. And uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy improves uh, overall survival and disease-free survival. And um, it can also uh, be good for the surgeon, surgeon, surgeon because it improves surgical uh, negative margins. When it comes to radiotherapy, it's indicated only when we have positive or close margins. Um, some protocols uh, regarding protons are, are now being studied for school days. Um, there's a proven impact on the local control uh, with 55 to 60 grays when we treat patients with close margins. Um, but the impact on overall uh, long-term survival is still remains controversial. So uh, this is another study. This is the MD Anderson study, where you can see that when we have a negative margins, the uh, uh, benefit is um, not statistically significant or, 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 or very little as compared to the benefit of radiotherapy when we have positive or close margins. So when we talk about the treatment, we need to remember that the cornerstone, cornerstone of treatment remains the surgery. Uh, it may be a unim, unim or multimodal approaches. We need to address uh, wide excisions and that, that may be difficult in the head and neck. Um, we need to define what we are considering an adequate margin. Are we still uh, aiming for the one centimeter? And also there are high risk tumors where we are going to need the multimodal treatment. Uh, and um, we're going to have to work on our uh, chemotherapy strategies. Chemotherapy uh, has shown a good response for head and neck osteosarcomas. Uh, they, may, they are shown to be chemosensitive, uh, chemosensible, and the chemosensitivity uh, may be a prognostic factor when we are planning the rest of the adjuvant treatment. Uh, they do have low, higher local recurrences, so the effect of modul, uh, multimodal uh, approach may drop after time, so we need to continue and be aware of their um, follow-up. Um, prognostic, um, the survival in terms of prognosis uh, is very um, variable, so you can see there are a lot of different um, outcomes. And there are some uh, studies that show that, that there are some specific uh, points that may be uh, impact um, alone for the prognostic factors as the age, the, the stage of presentation, and uh, whether they are uh, operated on or not. So very briefly, um, I work at the National Cancer Institute in Chile, where we see a lot of, of um, well, we are a small country, but we receive mainly um, sarcomas of the rest of the country. Most of them are also sarcomas. Um, this is a series of 24 patients from 2020. Our average is similar to the one reported for 38 years, and uh, our sex distribution is also very similar to the one I already uh, talked to you about. Our anatomic subsites are, are mainly maxilla and then mandibule. 
Um, and our histological grade is mainly high. Um, we offer patients chemotherapy followed by surgery and then again chemotherapy uh, uh, for the neoadjuvant uh, modality uh, or, or high grade tumors with multimodality. And we also um, uh, offer surgery mat chemotherapy in, um, in the rest of the patients. Um, surgical margins are uh, achieved in 74% of the patients in this series. And uh, we had, a, however, a overall survival uh, of uh, 54% at five years with a median follow-up of five years. Um, when we compare the overall survivals in terms of uh, histological grade, um, we see that the, it has an impact. Uh, the same with the subsite uh, having better impact, better survival for the mandible and for the maxilla, and of course better better survival for patients with negative margins than patients with positive margins. And when we assess our recurrences, we got forty six percent of recurrences in these four, 24 patients with a median time to recurrence of eighteen months. Most of them being local recurrences. Um, the disease-free survival uh, had little to do with the grade, uh, but um, shown a uh, uh, better curve when we, asked, we had a negative margin. Um, and uh, uh, when we put this in a logistic regression, we got that the um, independent factors that uh, caused impact on our outcomes were the fact of having a, a, a positive margin, a high-grade tumor, and the tumor more located in the maxilla. So as this is an infrequent uh, tumor, and uh, well, I specifically work in a small country, uh, the invitation is to do collaborative work so we can get a larger series and perhaps um, design a, a prospective trials. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Andre. Now we have question and answer session. facial reconstruction from Queens Mary University. First of all, I want to say thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to just talk and um, regarding of artificial intelligence that right now is so pop. As we know that, um, sorry. Okay. Um, as we know that right now, the preservation rhinoplasty is a surgical technique that focus on the um, preserving the natural um, outset. Do you have Okay, do you have my sound? Yes, doctor. Okay. Uh, preservation rhinoplasty, as we know, that is a surgical technique that focuses on preserving the natural structure. Okay. Um, is actually as a surgical technique that focuses much more in the natural structure and function of the nose um, while making the aesthetic improvement. And also it aims to minimize the disruption and maintain the integrity of nasal anatomy. As we know that in a preservation rhinoplasty that we should just um, check three items. First of all, we should elevate the uh, um, soft tissue envelope in a subchondrial or subperiosal area. We should actually preserve much more na nasal dorsum outcome. Uh, without any creating room uh, deformity. And also we need to preserve much more alar cartilage. And uh, as we know that it has a very great history from Dr. Goodall in 1899, and then we have Dr. Lothrop in uh, 1940, and then Dr. Cuddle in 1946, and also Dr. Closo um, in also in 1972, and we have Dr. Mestizo uh, with 1977. Um, as we know that right now, um, Sorry, I don't know why, just like, okay. As we know that um, the integration of artificial intelligence right now is very pop, especially when it comes with the deep machine learning. It shows much more great potential uh, in a various fields, in, including medicine and surgery in context also, in context of preservation rhinoplasty, the application of the preservation rhinoplasty with artificial intelligence can give us much more benefit. Um, one of the advantage that it gives us with artificial intelligence is the ability to analyze the large amount of um, medical data quickly and accurately that we want to have it. Also, we can just by training the um, AI algorithm um, in a vast 
actually database of presenting um, pre-operative pre and also post-operative for the images of the doctors and also the patient, the surgeons, and also all the surgical outcome. It can help in decision making also uh, with reduce the risk of human error and improve the overall efficacy of the um, uh, procedure. Actually, we know that during the preservation rhinoplasty, we have um, intraoperative guidance that it has um, actually played a crucial role in achieving the desired outcome when preserving the natural structure of the nose. And also we have some key aspects of intraoperative guidance with the preservation rhinoplasty. First of all, we just give much more proper visual visualizations. Actually, we just give much more clear and adequate uh, visualization that is essential during the procedure. The page, the um, surgeons may use various techniques also, such as endoscopic visualization or open rhinoplasty with much more better dissection to enhance the visualization much more proper. And also it gives you minimize the tissue disruption because um, the preservation rhinoplasty it has good things that um, we just pre preserve much more blood supply. And also we are not going to diminish um, um, the blood supply and much more um, structure of the nose. Um, also, we have a strategic um, um, actually incision. The incision can be carefully planned and um, to minimize the any kind of scaring, preserve the natural outcomes and also of the nose and involve using the hidden or in, con, um, in any kind of like um, error in um, incisions such as those made inside the nostrils like endonasal approach or even the natural crisis of the nose with external approach. And also um, the preservation um, of the cartilage, the surgeon focused much more on the preserving the existing nasal cartilage as much as possible. This can involve also a better reshaping and reposition of the existing cartilage. And then also we can have better removing and maintain much more structural integrity of the nose. Then we have also much more selective grafting in preservation rhinoplasty. The surgeon may use grafts that come from the patient-owned cartilage or other material to provide um, or enhance the specific area of the nose. That graft can be strategically planned to maintain the natural shape and structure of the nose. Also, it can um, avoid any over resection or over reshaping of the patients um, because over resection of the nasal tissue, it can be the cartilage or it can be the bone, should be avoided and it can lead to destabilize and also collapse the nasal structure. Um, and also, the surgeon can carefully plan and also execute any kind of procedure to achieve the desired aesthetic outcome and improvement while preserving the much more natural anatomy of the nose. Um, the other actually um, we have um, the other um, advantage is avoiding the or um, is nasal actually breathing uh, um, uh, nasal breathing uh, consideration that preservation rhinoplasty is aims to maintain to improve the nasal breath out uh, function. The surgeon can evaluate the address and breathe the um, and also for the breathing um, concern during the procedure, such as correcting the any kind of deviated septum or optimizing the nasal. Um, airflow. The other advantage is actually is customized approach. Each preservation rhinoplasty is a unique and then the, the um, surgeon much more tailor the technique and approach to the individual patient's needs and also the goals. Then also it gives a much more required comprehensive of the patient's nasal anatomy and also functional um, concern and desired aesthetic outcome. Okay, actually in summary, we know that the intraoperative guidance in preservation rhinoplasty involve careful visualization, strategic incision, preservation of the cartilage, selective grafting, advanced over resection, consideration of nasal breathing, and also a customized approach. These factors can collectively contribute to a successful preservation rhinoplasty with much more natural again structure and function of the nose while achieving the desired aesthetic improvement. Um, the second, actually the last um, outcome that we are going to have is much more um, in a summary, much more we have better aesthetic evaluation. The surgeon actually um, will have better um, aesthetic outcome of the rhinoplasty by comparing the post-operative result with the patient, um, pre-operative goals and also expectation of the patients. These include the ev evaluating the overall shaping, symmetry, proportion and contour of the nose. The other one is actually the functional um, assessment that 
Uh, it gives the preservation of rhinoplasty much more improved the nasal breathing outcomes, the functions, and achieve the any type of like if it is any kind of blockage in a um, nasal airflow or congestion of breathing, it can really help and determine the better outcome. Um, the healing and also the recovery is very important. The post-operative analysis also involve assessing the healing process and recovery of the patient. This, this can be the incision, the presence of swelling, bruising, or overcome any kind of like recovery prog progress, any complication or issues that can arise during the recovery can be actually talked with the patients and also with the surgeon and surgical technique. This patient satisfaction is another thing that actually patients can see the before and after with the um, AI and also can address any concern or any additional needs. Also, it gives better um, long-term result because the preservation of rhinoplasty is intended to provide long-lasting result. The surgeon may elevate the long-term outcome and the procedure monitoring the stability, durability, and also with the nasal, um, nasal structure to be natural and also accessibility to the changes that comes over the time. Um, revision also assessment in, uh, is another plan that in some cases revision rhinoplasty may be required in, um, to address the better uh, residual aesthetic in function and functional issues. The surgeon call can also um, much more evaluate um, the, whether the revision rhinoplasty is necessary or not, discuss the options with the patients for further refinement that is determined. And overall, the, actually, the post-op is very important. Uh, as I told you, uh, with the, um, with the um, AI, we can have better post-op outcome. We can plan better the preservation of rhinoplasty. We can have better accuracy, and we can have a better managing or measuring any kind of um, intraoperative um, complications. And it can help to determine the better optimal surgical um, approach, better post-operative outcomes, and better uh, discussions with the patient. And virtual simulation is another actually can be had with AI and deep motion learning that can enable the visual stimulation of preservation rhinoplasty that can allow the um, surgeons to visualize the potential surgical result and discuss them with the patients. And um, also we have the, um, another option as the automated image analysis that AI can algorithm on the, um, the actually automate any kind of analysis of post-operative images providing um, objective measurements of the surgical technique. And thank you so much for listening. Actually, you know that AI is coming up very just maybe recently and the preservation of rhinoplasty is actually modified, especially during the COVID with um, lots of doctors, Dr. Torimi, Dr. Uh, Bashir, and also Dr. Sajuk Basha. Lots of the doctors, they just actually uh, manipulated in a better way. And um, but right now AI is very pop, and I think that um, in the near future we are going to have better outcome for the patient and also for the surgeon to just also of like um, unsuccessful outcome um, of the patients and also with the doctor. Thank you so much for listening to me. If you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Shomara Rasami, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, Thank you. Now we have question and answer session. Do you have any questions for Dr. Shohat Kazami? As you know, the microscopes are indispensable for otologic surgeries. Uh, but by the time, the endoscopes have been popularized and increasingly used in the management of uh, various otologic diseases. Uh, for for which reason? Uh, because endoscopes are excellent in the assessment of disease extent, ocular chain sta status, and patency of middle ear ventilation pathways. These slides shows, uh, shows us the uh, range of view of microscope on left side and, and endoscope in right side. Endoscopes have a wide range of view, as you know. For this, Cohen and uh, 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 Cohen et al. designed and validated an endoscopic ear surgery classification system in which the extent of endoscope usage throughout the surgical procedure is defined as class 0, class 1, class 2, class 2A, 2B, and uh, class 3, in which the totally transcanal endoscopic ear surgery is performed with no need of microscopes. Uh, there are some 
favorable and unfavorable characteristics uh, of patient select selection for endoscopic ear surgery, uh, in favorable ones, uh, normal to generous external auditory canal diameter, disease isolated to tympanic membrane and middle ear, cholestatoma, which does not extend posterior to the dome of the lateral semicircular canal, uh, left ear for right-handed surgeon, and vice versa. And some un unfavorable characteristics are stenotic external auditory canal, extension of disease into mastoid, requirement for ossiculoplasty if inexperienced with the technique, requirement for extensive drilling, right ear for right-handed, and vice versa, and absence of adequate equipment. This slide shows us the indications of endoscopes and contraindications in figure D, in which cholestatoma extends to mastoid cavity. I want to show uh, um, uh, some videos for endoscopic ear surgery in which ventilation tube insertion, tympanoplasty, exploratory tympanotomy and stabetotomy and aticotomy for cholestatoma is performed. Yes, okay. Do you see? Hello? No video yet. This case is um, ventilation tube insertion for serous otitis media. Okay. Here is mucoid secretion aspirated. Then ventilation tube inserted inserted easily and the other side. And the other video is endoscopic butterfly tympanoplasty. Okay, you see the perforation. Dr. Mehmet, please yes. move on to the next slide, please. Don't you see? Yes, now the video is going. Okay. Yes. After the septization of all the margin of perforation, we get the tracheal cartilage. Okay, I go faster and and cartilage is inserted into the perforation with classically known method of butterfly tympanoplasty. And this was inlay butterfly tympanoplasty and an 
over underlay temporal muscle fascia tympanoplasty I want to show and avation then elevation of flap tympanometal flap and exposure of middle ear as you see And here is round window, incudo, stapedial joint, malleus, and fascia is harvested and inserted. Over manubrium malle. under the malleus. And the other video is exploratory tympanotomy. This patient had conductive hearing loss and he, with a history of tympanoplasty surgery and elevation of tympanometal flap. Uh, and Middle is exposed, and there is no connection between uh, incus and stapes, and stapes has soft tissues. Suprastructure is freed from disease mucosa. And then bone cement is prepared and performed. And then tagman is reconstructed with cartilage. And the other video is autosclerosis and elevation of tympanometal flap. Corda tympani. With birth. It was difficult to see the um, status. And this articulation of incudostapedial joint and measurements and drilling and then excuse me insertion of prosthesis with sub by supporting bone cement and closure of the flap. And, and the last video is endoscopic articoantrotomy. The bone erosion is seen. Elevation of flap. Clearance and Clearance of uh, any epithelial tissue with birth, the ossicles are intact. We repaired this defect with cartilage. Excuse me.
Yes, at the end, the ear canal is repaired. Yes, this is the last one. Okay. Okay, does Italy compared endoscopic and microscopic osteoplasty and concluded that uh, endoscopic uh, ear surgery yields better visualization, precise prosthesis placements, and early airborne gap closure. Uh, it also permits clearance of disease and preservation of normal mucosa, thus making endoscopic ear surgery more functional. Nair et al. Uh, reported Endoscopes provide better visualization of the hidden areas of middle ear, which aids in preservation of vital structures. And structural and functional outcomes of endoscopic ear surgery are comparable to microscopic ones. Endoscopic techniques provide superior patient-related outcomes due to better cosmesis, minimal post-operative pain, early return to daily routine. And thus, endoscopic techniques can be minimally invasive alternative option to microscopic techniques in the field of otology. And uh, Fernandez et al. also evaluated limits of uh, endoscopic ear surgery and the limits of EES are currently expanding in otologic and, and lateral skull-based surgery. Classic limitations of EES such as the bidimensional image and one-hand surgical technique uh, can be overcome with technical tips and surgical experience. Uh, in cholestatoma surgery, the extension of the cholestatoma to mastoid, extensive exposure of the mastoid dura, CSF, lyric, and fistula, extending to the posterior aspect of uh, uh, lateral semicircular canal represent limits for totally endoscopic management. Endoscopic assistance is a valid adjunct to classical microscopic approach to the lateral skull base. Tests in the lateral skull base uh, are currently limited to selected cases. In both middle ear and skull base surgery, the endoscopic approach can be easily combined with microscopic approach when required. In conclusion, we can say uh, endoscopic technique um, is not alternative to microscopes, but it is complementary to microscope. But still, for this reason, um, a microscope uh, still are sine qua non for otologic surgeries. Endoscopic technique reveal middle ear structures with great acuity. It has similar functional and anatomic results to microscopic surgery. It provides less post-operative pain, more comfortable, and early return to daily routine is possible. It's a one-hand surgery being the most significant disadvantage of endoscopic technique. Thanks for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Mehmet, for your wonderful presentation. Now we have question and answer session for Dr. Mehmet. You provided me an offer to present on this day. Thank you so much for that. So why? Uh, so my rare case is about a unilateral double barrel internal acoustic meatus, which was uh, reported in an adolescent boy. And he had a severe sensory neural hearing loss. Yeah, next slide, please. So as we all know, internal acoustic meatus is being divided into a vertical and a horizontal crust. The vertical crust um, is dividing the facial nerve and the cochlear nerve. Uh, and the transverse crust below, it divides in the superior and the inferior vestibular nerve. So usually, if uh, in this case, any congenital anomaly occurs, 
the internal acoustic meatus, the bone forms in between the superior and the inferior vestibular nerve, additional to the Bill's bar. And that is why it is the double barrel, like a two barrels, um, it will present. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, so duplication of internal acoustic meatus is a very rare congenital anomaly of the temporal bone. So usually if it occurs, it will be a bilateral double barrel. But in, my, in our case presentation, this boy had a unilateral double barrel sensor uh, double barrel internal acoustic meatus and um, they also have vestibular nerve hypoplasia along with cochlear nerve hypoplasia but in our case the vestibular nerve i will show you the reports which she says the vestibular nerve was functioning normally and also clinically he didn't have any symptoms which was pertaining to the vestibular nerve so it was very rare that the bone grew only along the cochlear nerve and not disturbing the facial or the superior vestibular nerve. Okay, and this anomaly is most common 20% prevalence at the rate of stenosis of internal acoustic meatus. Because of this stenosis, he presented with the sensory neural hearing loss, which is affecting only the cochlear nerve, not the facial or the superior or inferior vestibular nerve. Next, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is 11 year old boy who reported to a hospital with a unilateral right-sided sensory neural hearing. He said right-sided hearing loss for six months. Because of COVID, he was using headphones for the class presentation. So by birth, he didn't have any complaints or symptoms which is pertaining to his hearing loss. It was so subtle and obvious that he noticed only during his online classes, it had, his headphone was not working on the right side. So what he did, he checked with the other, um, his parents and other siblings to check if the headphone was working on the right side. For them, it was fine. For this guy, he still had um, a problem on, on using his headphones on the right. Otherwise, he was absolutely normal kid. His developmental was history was normal. He didn't have any siblings with similar uh, family history. Um, so otherwise, he was absolutely fine. Didn't have any facial nerve um, problems or facial uh, um, uh, asymmetry, as well as he didn't report any diff, uh, giddiness or um, or any um, unsteadiness on his. Uh, mannerism. Uh, so next slide, please. So this was very obvious that it, so when he presented, we were thinking probably he would have had, uh, you know, headphones, so noise induced hearing loss. But what changed the whole picture was the tuning focus test. So when we did a tuning focus test, he had a false negative Rini on the right side and positive Rini on the left, which was more clear that he had a dead ear, like complete uh, hearing loss on the right side, which then led us to go ahead with a pure tone audiogram. Next slide, please. So that's why tuning folks is the best test. Even before doing an audiogram, we should do a tuning folk test and it is more important, which, you know, led us to find what's the wrong in this guy and helped us to find the reason for his hearing loss. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so PTA, so he had similar right-sided severe hearing loss. It was not a total profound hearing loss. It was just severe, okay? And the left side, it showed normal hearing, okay? And the tympanogram was A-type curve on both sides. So we did a further assessment for the vestibular nerve as well by doing CVMP and OVMP. So CVMP, the peaks were low on the right side, Ampli peak uh, amplitude ratio was low on the right side and normal on the left. 
Okay, and similarly for over and as well, left side was absolutely normal, but the amplitude was reduced on the on on the, on the right side. So <clears throat> Vera showed severe sensor neural hearing loss on the right side, whereas normal hearing on the left side. <laughs> Sorry, next side, please. Yeah, so this is the picture of <clears throat> uh, Bera findings, which is showing the right ear amplitude was 95 dB hearing loss and left side, it was completely normal. Okay, next slide. So what we did, we went ahead because we were we didn't know why his um, amplitude was reduced on CVMP, OVM, as well as PTA showed, Vera showed severe hearing loss on the right side without any other symptoms of giddiness, what I go. We were, so we were just wondering what to do and hence we went ahead with the CT scan. So the CT scan, as you can see the picture, the black arrow, the right side has two dots. That means the in, that is the internal acoustic meatus. So it is two in on right side, whereas one oval on the left side, which showed that he has a double barrel unilateral sense, uh, internal acoustic meatus. And MRI also showed the similar picture of right rubble barrel internal acoustic meatus with hypoplastic cochlea and inferior vestibular nerve. Okay, and normal internal acoustic meatus on the left side. So this is a 3D picture which is showing again the right side double barrel sensor, uh, internal acoustic meatus. Next slide, please. So uh, Duplication of internal acoustic meatus is a very rare congenital anomaly. And even if it presents, usually it will have a severe sensory neural, I mean, profound sensory neural hearing loss. And it will be usually associated with some inner, inner uh, ear anomalies or facial nerve anomalies or vestibular nerve anomalies. But in our case, we exclusively found that uh, he had a unilateral double barrel internal acoustic meatus, which is affecting only the cochlear nerve. And it is not that the cochlear nerve is completely lost. It is having some nerve pathology, nerve functioning, which is hypoplastic and not aplastic, as well as it is not affecting the vestibular nerve. So that was the uniqueness of our case. And this case report, the boy with had a severe sensory neural hearing loss. Usually, there will be a profound hearing loss, but this guy had a severe sensory neural hearing loss. So he was benefited by just fitting a hearing aid instead of doing a cochlear implant. Uh, however, previous studies has showed twenty percentage of such cases had also had inner ear anomalies with facial nerve ecclesia. Sorry, facial nerve palsy. Although absence of Bera on the right side and the cervical and ocular VEM, C VEM and O VEM showed minimal peak on the right side, still the vestibular nerve was functioning and opposite the left side had a bigger amplitude, which means that it is trying to compensate the function of the vestibular nerve on the right side. Next slide, please. So, um, the, lo the loss of sensory neural hearing loss is attributed to the development of the bony canal around the vestibular cochlear nerve introduced with the embryonic, embryonic cochlear and vestibular nerve in association with chondrification of facial nerve apart from the ossification of the mesoderm in their aplasticity or hypoplasticity. This will inhibit the development of internal acoustic meatus, thereby making them stenotic. This also could have been due to impact transmission of the inductor uh, canal 
uh, of the uh, nerve function it, because of this stenosis around the cochlear nerve that would have inhibited the signals when we are doing the c vamp and o vamp that explains that the amplitude was low on right side when compared to the left side so in this case report the appearance of intact facial nerve suggests that there is an isolated developmental so there is a isolated development of facial nerve that later envelops the canal around the vestibular cochlear nerve resulting in the duplication of internal acoustic meatus this was also reported to be the cause for development of duplicated internal acoustic meatus in a previous study next slide please So the difficulty in determining the bony canal diameter for the vestibular cochlear nerve in patients with duplicated internal acoustic meatus has been overcome by recent advances in CT scans, which provided a detailed high-resolution imaging of bony structure. This technique provides a more intimate visualization of inner ear with a multiplanar reconstruction along with a 3D imaging. A CT can specifically identify the bony abnormalities and inner ear abnormalities. MRI is useful for the soft tissue. As we all know, an MRI has revealed that right cochlear and inferior vestibular nerve were extremely thinned out in this condition. Yeah. It was not aplastic, it was hypoplastic. Next slide, please. So. So this emphasized the application of both CT and MRI to evaluate a bony and the neural structure because cochlear implantation is usually considered as only for the candidates with a normal cochlear nerve. And this patient was found to have, have an improvement with the hearing aids with the air conduction hearing aid. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vaishnavi, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, now we have a question and answer session. Of malignant neoplasms and represent less 1% of all malignant tumors and 3 to 5% head and neck malignant neoplasms. Patient age range is large from 19 to 89 years, with median age of onset by an around 50 and a slight prevalence in males. Clinical presentation is non-specific but usually includes nasal obstruction, epistaxis, headaches, symptoms of cranial nerve compression, visual impairment and vision loss or periorbital edema. Recently discovered SMARC B1 or INI1 deficient carcinoma has become the subject of multiple research studies. This growing interest can be attributed to the aggressive nature of this pathology with frequent metastatic disease in the brain and skull base, uh, poor prognosis and low survival rates. For the first time, this group of carcinoma was discovered in 2014 following morphological and immunohistochemical analysis of 39 cases with initial diagnosis of synonasal undifferentiated carcinoma or non keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma. Following this brief introduction, we would like to present a SMARC-B1 deficient carcinoma clinical case in a 31-year-old male. 31-year-old male came to the neurosurgery department of Federal State Autonomous Institution Burdenko National Medical Research Center of Neurosurgery, complaining of nasal breathing difficulties, reduced vision, especially in the right eye, and facial asymmetry due to proptosis, with both orbital and upper mandibular region involvement on the left side. During physical examination, the following clinical signs were observed. Left exophthalm, proptosis with orbital and upper mandibular region involvement on the left side, cranial nerves involvement, hyposmia and extraocular muscle pulse affecting sideways and downward eye movements on the left. 
on magnetic resonance imaging and computed tomography scans, an extensive craniofacial tumor was detected with anterior cranial fossa, nasal cavity and left orbital involvement and paranasal sinuses involvement. Based on biopsy results, an initial anaplastic cancer diagnosis had been made. Later, the patient underwent a two-phase surgical intervention. Phase 1. Partial craniofacial tumor resection, mainly on the left side, using microsurgical technique followed by a plastic surgery to correct the cranial base defect with a periosteum graft. Phase 2. Transnasal endoscopic resection of extensive craniofacial tumor on the left with simultaneous plastic correction of the complex surgical defect. Since this tumor is invasive and infiltrative in nature and therefore its radical and complete removal is impossible, a partial resection in the orbita, ethmoidal sinuses, septum and sphenoid sinus was performed. The patient was discharged from hospital with improvements in his condition and advised to follow up regularly with his local neurologist and ophthalmologist not to blow his nose for one and a half to two months if obstructed, to use vasoconstricting nose drops, to undergo a disability assessment, to consult an oncologist and to start chemotherapy and radiation. Later, this patient came to our pathology department for a second opinion. Upon re-examination of histological slides at the pathology department of Central Clinical Hospital Russian Railways Medicine, tumor growth was observed to be in the form of sheets, chains and small clusters of large, relatively monomorphic tumor cells with hyperchromatic nuclei, nucleoli visualization and with signs of angioinvasion. Immunohistochemical testing of Microslides showed cytoplasmic expression of pain CK and CK19, focalized expression of CK7, CK56, neuroendocrine markers uh, like chromogranin A and synaptophysin, and nuclear expression of P63. There is no expression of CD56 in the tumor cells. Based on the morphologic description presented above on the results of the immunohistochemistry tests, differential diagnostic process was mainly centered around sinonasal small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, astasia neuroblastoma and recently discovered smark b one deficient carcinoma. Therefore, we have decided to order an additional immunohistochemistry test for antibodies to INI1. While no expression of this marker was detected in the tumor cells, in the stroma cells the expression was retained. Hence, based on morphological and immunohistochemical findings, the malignant neoplasm has been identified as smark b one deficient synonasal carcinoma. Unfortunately, the patient died from tumor progression six months after his consultation. Synonasal smark b one deficient carcinoma is caused by a mutation in the smark b one gene which encodes the eponymous protein which in turn is responsible for suppressing tumor growth, but it's tumor suppression gain protein. This protein is part of non-fermentable protein complex SWISNF switch sucrose non-fermentable. This protein complex can be found in virtually every human tissue and it's responsible for DNA repair and correct tissue cell differentiation. The complex is comprised of one or two ATPases SMARK A2 or SMARK A4, groups of core subunits, usually SMARK B1, uh, SMARK KK1, SMARK KK2, and variable subunits. Mutations in the SMARK B1 gene lead to the development of several rare malignant neoplasms like SMARK B1 deficient carcinoma. 
central nervous system atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumors, malignant rhabdoid kidney and soft tissue tumors, epithelioid sarcoma, certain subtypes of myoepithelial soft tissue carcinoma, and extraskeletal myxoid chondrosarcoma. Histology tests of many malignancies that lack smark b one or INA1 expression show rhabdoid type tumor cells. Histologically, synonasal smarky B1 deficient carcinoma is often characterized by the presence of sheets, chains, nests, and small clusters of large and rather monomorphic cells, usually of rhabdoid and basaloid morphology, with hyperchromatic nuclei, nucleoli visualization, coarse chromatin, and multiple mitotic sites. Multinuclear cells are often present. Additionally, pseudo-alveolar and pseudo-papillary patterns may be found. Secondary tumor changes often present as large focalized areas of necrosis. As far as immunohistochemical characteristics are concerned, the following may be observed. Pencytokeratin expression in the tumor cells, possible focalized expression of the neuroendocrine markers like synoptophysin and hormogranin A, and squamous markers like, for example, P63 and P40. Loss of expression of INI1 in the tumor cells with retained expression in the stroma cells is the compulsory trademark of this pathology. Lack of expression of myoepithelial markers such as calponin S100 and SMA is also observed. Differential diagnostic process is extensive and implies eliminating the following synonasal pathologies. Synonasal undifferentiated carcinoma, synonasal small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, estasia neuroblastoma, HPV-related multiphenotypic synonasal carcinoma, synonasal nut carcinoma, Ewing sarcoma, and myoepithelial carcinoma. Now, Let's take a look at a few of them. Synonasal small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma is a rare high-grade tumor of neuroectodermal and epithelial origin, which represents 1% to 3% of all synonasal tract tumors. Median age of onset is around 40 to 55 years old, and it's more prevalent in males. Clinical presentation in synonasal small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma is usually non-specific, usually including nasal obstruction, hyposmia, facial deformity, and headaches. However, as in the case with olfactory neuroblastoma, some patients may show signs of paraneoplastic syndrome with inadequate levels of antidiuretic hormone secretion. Symptoms of spiral neoplastic syndrome include headache, nausea, memory loss, anorexia, and in some cases, severe hyponatremia may cause anxiety, restlessness, sleepness, stupor, and seizure. This tumor is characterized by clear, localized, aggressive, and destructive growth pattern with Metastatic disease rapidly appearing for far away from the origin site. As a result, it has poor prognosis and low survival rates. Histologically, synonasal small cell carcinoma is characterized by different sized nests of round, relatively monomorphic cells with large hyperchromatic nuclei, salt and pepper chromatin presence nucleoli visualization, and well-defined fibrotic stroma between nests. During immunophenotypical analysis, cytoplasmic pan-cytocaratin expression in the tumor cells is observed, along with membrane expression of CD56, and at least one of neuroendocrine markers such as hormogranin A and synaptophysin. 
TDF1 and S100 markers are not present. Retained I and I1 expression in the tumor cells. A stage neuroblastoma, also called olfactory neuroblastoma, was first described by Berger and Luke in 1924. It's a malignant neuroectodermal tumor with neuroblastic differentiation, most often found around cribriform plate of nasal cavity. Phenotypically, this tumor is situated right in between purulent nerve tissue neoplasms, like for example neuroblastoma and paraganglioma, and neuroendocrine epithelial tumors. This type of tumor represents about 3% of all synonasal tract tumors. Patient age bracket is rather large, from 2 to 90 years old, with a median age of about 50 to 60 years old and a slight prevalence in males. Clinical presentation is also usually non-specific and at an early stage of the disease it may include nasal abstraction, epistaxis, headaches, epiphora, rhinorrhea and facial asymmetry. Some patients present with anosmia, uh, it's less than 5%. Very rarely, in less than 2% of cases, patients may show different sides of paraneoplastic syndrome like adrenocorticotropic syndrome with inadequate levels uh, of antidiuretic hormone secretion. This tumor is characterized by a localized, aggressive and destructive growth pattern where it can fill up the entire nasal cavity and infiltrate paranasal sinuses, orbita, cranial base and cranium, resulting in increased intracranial pressure, headaches and possible cranial nerves involvement. As far as prognosis, cork station and grading of the tumor are of utmost importance. The most popular system used to determine histological grade of malignancy in estasia neuroblastoma has been developed in 1988 by Himes et al. Uh, the main grading criteria are tumor structure, signs of nuclear polymorphism, presence of stroma cells, rosette-like structures, mitotic sites, and areas of focal necrosis. Histologically, Low-grade olfactory neuroblastoma is represented by lobulus and ness with a well-defined and vascularized fibrotic uh, hyalinotic stroma cells in between. Furthermore, rosette-like structures with palisade arrangements of tumor cells surrounding a neuropil, its homoride rosettes, can be often found. It's worth adding that Flexner Winterstainer rosettes, where the central element does not contain the fiber rich neuropil, can sometimes also be observed. Tumor cells are usually small with scant cytoplasm and salt and papal chromatin. High grade tumors have a solid structure, a cellular and nuclear polymorphism, high mitotic activity, and frequent focal necrotic sites. Immunohistochemical estasia neuroblastoma is characterized by cytoplasmic cytokeratin expression in the tumor cells, diffuse cytoplasmic neuron-specific enolase, synaptophysin, hormogranin A and CD56 expression, as well as nuclear INI1 expression in the tumor cells. Sometimes, S100 expression can be observed in the peripheral tumor cells of rosette-like structures and nests. Most synonasal smark b one deficient carcinomas are diagnosed at a late stage of the disease and therefore the prognosis is really poor. That's why early detection and diagnosis are absolutely crucial. If signs of rhabdoid and basaloid differentiation are detected, Along with multiple mitotic sites and extensive areas of focalized necrosis, it is recommended to exclude possible SMARC-B1 gene mutation through immunohistochemical testing with antibiotics to INI1. In this case, fluorescence in situ hybridization method is less sensitive than immunophenotype testing because of the presence of heterozygous deletions in the SMARC-B1 gene.
Despite poor prognosis and low survival rates, Jason Weissman, Brandon Dixon have reported good response of sinonasal smark B1 deficient carcinoma to neoadjuvant chemotherapy in some patients, particularly to tisplatin. The hypothesis is that it's better to administer chemo and radiotherapy preoperatively since this may significantly decrease tumor size and therefore lower various risk factors associated with surgical intervention. However, due to relapse and metastatic disease appearing in areas far away from the original site, even with preoperative chemo and radiotherapy and surgery, mortality rates remain high. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, uh, actually, this technique was published uh, in uh, uh, International Journal of uh, Otolaryngology. Uh, this uh, this uh, idea was first uh, uh, was first uh, done in uh, NYU in NYU London Medical City. Uh, I was there for a scholarship with uh, and uh, I met the professor Dr. Thomas Roland at uh, this uh, university. So we have we did this idea and we applied it in many cases and it was a very good idea. Uh, so I published this paper with Dr. Thomas Roland. Uh, this is my view with Dr. Thomas Roland during the scholarship. Uh, this is uh, my photo in uh, my university, Zagreb University in Egypt. Uh, uh, regarding uh, the idea of this uh, technique, let's uh, first uh, say a uh, small introduction. Uh, cochlear implantation started in 1970, and since uh, the beginning of cochlear implantation, uh, there was a continuous change in the design of the skin and the uh, flaps. But nowadays, most of the surgeons uh, use the post auricular incision with a specific limitation of the flaps design, not like in the past. Uh, during beginning of cochlear implantation, the flaps and the incisions, the idea of the flap and the incision is to make the uh, to make the uh, flap cover the device completely and to make good exposure to the surgical field. So the I, I, the old concept is the device the complete is under the flap. This is a, at the beginning of cochlear implantation, the device was very small, so the device was completely under the flap. However. Uh, the advantage of this is to give wide exposure and also the, the device will be completely under the flap and the, the device will and the electrode will not pass below the incision. However, uh, there was a high incidence of flap necrosis with the old designs, okay, because the, the foreign body below a flap, putting a foreign body below a flap carries a risk of flap necrosis and the extrusion. So the, the, the idea changed to, uh, be, and especially the device become larger and become, should be more backward. Uh, so the idea changed, and only we do a small posterior incision, and we go to the, uh, this area by a subosteal bucket to implant the device. So the idea now is uh, changing. Uh, the incision uh, nowadays become uh, not not completely the, the flaps nowadays not completely cover the device. It is uh, away from the device. Okay. Uh, and uh, the skin incision should be separate from the periosteal incision, as we will mention in the next slides. So the, the idea changed, and the incision now become should be not passing through the electrode, should be away from the de device. Okay. Uh, uh, <clears throat> regarding the incision, first design of the post auricular incision was a, a long incision. It's named was lazy S incision. This is the first design of the post auricular incision. Uh, nowadays, the incision become very small, just to see shape the posterior incision, three centimeter. And most of the work, uh, most of the cochlear implant surgeon uh, now uh, do the small posterior incision. How how we can do a, a exposure to the flap uh, to the device? The device is more backward with this uh, posterior incision. Uh, first, we have to make the, after doing skin incision, and uh, we have to make the section to cover the to expose the perosteum in uh, behind the oracle 
بدي تو كفر ا بيج اريا اوف ذا اوف ذا بروست هير ان ذا بروست بروسيس سو افتر ميكينج ذا افتر ميكينج ذا سيجن وي هاف تو ميك ا فلاب اوف سكين تو ديسكت سكين اند سب كوتينيس تيشو فروم ذا ذا ماستويد بيروستيوم اند ذا بروستيوم كفرنج ذا سكال وي هاف تو ديسكت ان ذس اريا مور ديسكت مور ديب از وي سي اباوت مور ذان 5 سنتيمتر باند ب اوراكل You have to dissect deep or backward, to, to, so you can after that making the brachial flap. Uh, the classic flap is the bulba flap. Bulba flap is the anterior base, anterior base brachial flap. But the bulba flap is, uh, is one flap. Usually the long axis is more than the vertical, uh, the horizontal axis. The vertical axis sorry, is more than the horizontal axis. So this makes the, this flap is weak and uh, sometimes it is lost during dissection. So the, this is a classic flap, okay? The classic design for this flap is the anterior based bulva flap. Most of the cochlear implant surgeon do the anterior bulva flap, but the problem is that the anterior bulva flap sometimes is not completely covering the mastoid and not completely covering the electrodes, and sometimes it is lost during dissection. Uh, to understand the idea of the hour flap, okay? You have to understand that uh, where, where we put the, the seat for the receiver simulator. Usually, if this is a, the patient uh, with cochlear implantation, the seat is present here the, for the receiver simulator. It should be uh, backward, 45 degrees with consummate line, and it should be uh, away from the, from the, the, the mic microphone behind the oracle. It should be away from the, this, okay? Uh, from the microphone, which is put behind the oracle and should be uh, uh, at least one centimeter behind behind the microphone. Okay, at least so should should be as there is a distance here, uh, and it should be forty-five degree behind the consummate line. So it, actually, it is not on the temporal bone; it is on the parietal bone. If we see the, the position of the seat, it is present here on the parietal bone. It should be move very backward. Not here in the mastoid, the device should be here in the, in the parietal bone. So to expose this area with, with a bulb of lab, we have to take the classic bulb of lab, we have to take uh, the flap more backward to, to expose the bulb, to make the bulb of lab very backward to expose the area of the, the, the bucket of the seat. If you take the bulb of lab too long, you have risk of injury of mastoid mystery vein, and also the flap is very will be very weak, and there is a risk, a risk of loss of the flap. And if you make a small short flap of a bulb flap, you will not expose, you will not, you will not expose the, the, the ideal site of the bucket. The seat will be not placed backward as, as should be. It should be anterior. With, uh, and as we know, when the seat is anterior near the template, it will make problems with, uh, with, the, with the magnet uh, and also it will make a problem with the, with the wound of mastoid cavity itself. So, The, if you make the, the flap short, you will not you can you will not be able to make the device move more backward. Okay, so, and if you make the flap is too long, to expose the, the, the area posterior, the flap will carry risk of loss. So what is the best idea of, of the flap? This is the, 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 the our idea now is to make to make two flaps, not only one flap, dividing the anterior base bulb flap into two flaps, like this. First, you will make a small anterior base bulb flap. And the posterior part will be inferior based another flap. So we'll make two flaps, one anterior based periosteal flap and one inferior based uh, periosteal flap. Uh, 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 you will dissect it downward till you reach the area of the mastoid machine ribbon, then stop the section. Now, after doing this, you can expose the, the area of the seat of the device, and also you can uh, avoid the, the risk of, uh, of loss of the flap or uh, Or, uh, and also you can reapproximate the flaps at the end of the surgery very easy, as we will see in the next photo. Uh, as we say, said, uh, after doing the skin incision, you have to dissect it backward to expose the prostium. There's two options. This is a, a patient who uh, was done before we're doing this, the, the new idea. This is the patient done with classic bulb flap. As we see, the bulb flap is very long. Okay. And this is the prostial flap uh, is very long. And after this section, as you see, the valve flap become stretched and become narrow. And actually, this flap after surgery could not be cover the, 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 the whole uh, uh, surgical field completely and will not cover the device completely yet. And sometimes it's completely lost. So the, we modified it to our modified flap, which is this is anterior and this is posterior. We make a small anterior based valve flap and another. 
بوستيرور بفلاب بيزد انفيروري اون ذا اريا اوف ذا ماستويد اون ميشري فينس وي ميك تو فلابس اند افتر ذيس از انذر بيشنت اولسو ذيس از انتيرور فلاب ذيس از ذا بوستيرور فلاب اند افتر اكسبوزينج ذا انتيرور فلاب يو ستارت تو اكسبوز ذا بوستيرور فلاب اند افتر ذات ناو يو كان ريتش ذا اريا that this is after complete uh, dissection and as you see the anterior flap is taken by this retractor the posterior flap is uh, was drawn downward and you really don't need to dissect more down to the mastoid emissary vein you can just, just stop the section till here and now you can easily put your your uh, retractor uh, and dissector and you can dissect the area of the mastoid uh, of the seat of the device and now you can drill the seat of the device more posterior in the parietal bone and as we said in the parietal and on the temporal bone And now this is the, the final shape of the seat of the device. Now we can put the seat very behind and you have a very good exposure to, to the seat. And this is the inferior flap can be seen here and the anterior flap is taken anterior to the mastoid. Now we have very good exposure to the whole surgical field, the, the seat and the, you can now do mastoid, mastoid drilling very, very safely. And then you can stabilize the device say, say easy. As we we use to stabilize the device, we first uh, you, you we take must uh, tie suture here between uh, to approximate the parostium in this area and this area with the parostium of the inferior base the flap. Now the device is in, inside here in the bucket, and this is the electrode coming out from the device. We take this tie suture with uh, borolin suture to be to to be to be to, to stay for a long time between the the parostium here and the parostium of the flap and the parostium here. So this, this is. Make uh, more stabilization of the device, and as you see now, the inferior base the flap is completely covering the bone and covering the electrode very good. Okay, this is a mastoid cavity, and this is a tunnel. We do it for further stabilization of the device. This is uh, the tunnel, but the electrode bus through the tunnel. Okay, and uh, now uh, this is a tie suture, and now after uh, this is after uh, uh, reapproximate the posterior part of the flap. And this is after reapproximation of the anterior part of the flap. As you see, the anterior part of the flap at the end of surgery now is reapproximated here very easily without tension, without anything, just suture here, suture here, and the flap returning back very good. And this is the posterior part of the flap. Now the bone cover covers the device completely and covers the electrodes and the cover, and the seat is the device is very is settled backward. And this is after final uh, suturing of the flaps. As you see, the com there is complete parostial covering of the device. The device now is very safe under the parostium. As we know, if the device is not completely covered the parostium, this is one of the most important causes of extrusion of the device. Now the device is completely covered with parostium. Now the device is completely safe from extrusion. And now you can just uh, suture the skin and uh, finish your surgery. This is the shape after suturing of the skin. And Now the surgery is finished. To summarize the, the advantage of our modified flap, the our modified flap can get a good exposure to the receiver stimulator bucket, as well as the mastoid cavity. We, uh, so through the anterior part of the flap, you can uh, expose the mastoid cavity good, and you can do drilling good to the mastoid cavity. And through the posterior part of the flap, you can expose the area of the bucket of the device, and you can drill the bucket of the device very safely. You have a very good exposure. Okay, and also you have a very good exposure. You 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 can now dissect the backward very safe without a risk of emissary vein bleeding. You are away from mastoid emissary vein bleeding. Okay, and you can dissect the backward to, to make the, the receiver simulator very backward on the parietal bone. Uh, when we make two wide based flap rather than one long narrow flap, there will be better blood supply to both flaps. And uh, during reapproximation at the end of surgery, you can repositioning re and reapproximate them. With full device coverage, easily without any loss of any barost. Uh, again, we have published uh, our experience in 26 cases. Uh, this 26 patient, about uh, 16 patient was in NYU Langone Medical Center in New York, and the 10 patient in our university, Zagzag University. So we have published uh, our experience in 16 patient, as uh, it sorry, in 26 patient. Uh, this paper was published uh, in, in uh, uh, 2018, uh, uh, maybe four or five years ago. Uh, 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 and after that, still we are doing this uh, technique, but uh, no, no, we are not uh, no published any more, uh, more experience, okay? Uh, but still, we are, when you do cochlear implantation, we use this technique in, in, uh, during FLAB uh, the, 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 the design. Um, uh, we, as we see, the, the, uh, all of the results at the end of surgery, we have completely covered the device with the parostium, complete parostial occlusion was achieved in all the devices. Uh, the complete the device and the electrode is below the parostium. 
Uh, in all cases, we do not face any risk of mastoid or major vein injury. And uh, after surgery, because uh, we have completely covered the advance with the prostate, we, we did not find any surgical complication like device migration, wound infection, wound hematoma, delayed wound healing. As we know, all of this complication usually are associated with uh, incomplete uh, repair of the prostate and incomplete suturing well of the uh, of the cover of the device. So because we have completely covered the device with perostium, we, we did not find any device migration, no wound infection, no wound hematoma, uh, no delayed wound healing. And also this flap uh, allow us for better stabilization of the device, as we mentioned. So uh, we did not find, find any risk of surgical complication on all of these 26 cases. And this was our experience. And uh, thank you for uh, your uh, intention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yasser, for your wonderful presentation. Now we have question and answer session. Do you have any questions 